Hi, Bobby. Good morning. Good morning. So Terry Riley's going to be with us today. She is yeah. there. I am here. Oh, she is. Yeah, you. I'm the old lady in the corner here. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> oh, are you, dear? I'm. I'm wonderful. You look amazing. What are you doing? What are you um, eating? I want to know. <laughs> chocolate mostly. Oh, my favorite. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it, Bobby. That that was the answer. The more of chocolate, course. the better. Chocolate takes care of everything. <laughs> I have a short little prayer. If you okay. Want. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Creator of all that is, please heal the broken, make well the sick, bring happiness to the depressed, bring love to the lonely, bring food to the hungry, and peace to the world. Amen. Blessed be. That's Blessed lovely. Who it is. And chocolate to us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, tr I tried <laughs> mushroom chocolate yesterday. Oh, very good. good. Apparently, yeah. it's multiple kinds of mushrooms going into coffees and teas, and now chocolate. It's like okay. I've seen that. I've seen that. It was very. I haven't seen it. So tell, tell me more about that. Well, it's it's all the healing elements of these different kinds of mushrooms are making it into mainstream now, and so they're making all these products. Really? So, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So mushrooms cool. are no longer just a fungus among us. <laughs> or the psychedelic exactly and, 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 and no longer just us new age hippies that believe that huh that's right that's right <laughs> sally how was your journey yesterday you want to tell us about it we can't hear you dolly mm -hmm. you're, you're dolly. muted hi everybody good morning hi. yeah i had a sacramental journey yesterday with some psilocybin i use it as nice. a spiritual awakening it was um good very cleansing yeah. kind of in the spirit of the season spring cleaning <laughs> i had fasted <clears throat> uh ahead of time and fasting is always a spiritual experience too for me so yeah, yeah it was beautiful good uh, where's dolly mm -hmm. i don't know dolly are you going to be online or not? I'm coming. I just wanted to finish this <laughs> She's doing a few last minute things. She'll be here. <laughs> nice. And my, my friend Katrina's coming too, but she said she might be a couple minutes late. Okay. Okay. She was doing a tarot reading. Oh, nice. Great. So Terry Riley, tell me what's new with your life, my dear. Well, lots. You know, I, I'm... Um, I'm retired, which right. means I have a lot of time on my hands. And so I'm just getting into a lot of different things and I'm really enjoying what I'm learning. And is the US government still gonna function without you? <laughs> well, they're doing a pretty bad job. They were doing a bad job with me. So <laughs> I don't know why so are, are they doing better or gooder? <laughs> well, you tell me. I, I I can't believe we can't pay our bills, but it's a it's a thing. It's a thing. Yeah. It's a thing. How much are you still working? Are you still lecturing? Uh, no, I'm not lecturing any longer. I retired, but I am. Uh, I'm still. Uh, I consult with uh, you know a few of my clients once in a while if they get in a pinch. Or I see a lot of grandchildren of uh, people I saw in therapy. Oh, nice! So it's a generational thing. Very good. Yeah. So they and they want to come in, and I say, no, I'm I'm no longer practicing. So, but I I will talk to them for a while, get their background, and then refer them out. To people I think would be a good match. So, you know, I'm kind of a matchmaker these days. <laughs> Very nice. So I can tell you my mental health has improved like 9,000% since I left the government. Okay. Believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> Believe it or not. That's great. That's great, Terry. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. So how's the rest of your family doing? Everyone's wonderful. Everyone is, everyone is making, they're finding their way. So tell me about your kids and how old they are. I'm uh, afraid to ask. Yeah. Um, Caitlin's 35. Kevin's going to be 33, if you can believe that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Hardly kiddies. Hardly kiddies anymore, huh? No. 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 What's Kevin, well, what's Kevin doing these days? He works in Arizona for the state. He is a aged, an investigator of aged fraud. Of what? 
an investigator of fraud against older people? A thug? Oh, fraud. 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 Instance of like commercial fraud or business fraud against older oh, people. Oh, fraud. I thought you say F-O-G. No, fraud. yeah. <laughs> no, that's fraud. a piece he he'd be very he's, he's he has a very analytical mind. That would be, I bet he's good at that. Yes, he is. And and, uh, she's good. She's still with her turtles. She's still at the aquarium, and she's doing now. She's doing fundraising instead of just uh, hospital care. Oh, so good. She's expanding herself too. So and it looks like Shirley's to... joined us. Huh? Hi, Shirley. Shirley. Hi, Jean. I don't think Hi. so. Welcome. And we have Dr. Jean Clemens on. Hey, Dr. Hello, Jean. Jean. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Good, thank you. Oh, you look so familiar to me, Dr. Jean. <laughs> like I may have met you through Charlie. Could Probably. be. Jean and I have been friends for many years. We, uh, we went to our graduate schools together, got our, our doctorates together. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So um, do we it's here? Should we... It's so yeah. beautiful to see Shirley. I'm sorry you're cutting in and out. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's so beautiful to see Shirley. Shirley, can you hear us? Can you thumbs up? I can't see her. Is she there? Amy, so Shirley, how are you? Hello. Oh, hi. hi, Shirley. Uh, hi. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. I don't know what's the matter with this. I got on here, but. Uh, so you have the picture, my volume, but you can't I hear. even have my ears in, but <laughs> I can't get the volume up. So sorry, at least I could look at all of your faces and <laughs> smile. <laughs> And say thank you for being in my life. <laughs> no. Cool. Hey, hey, Terry. God, you look gorgeous. I love your hair like that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yep. All right. So shall we start? Terry. Sure. Hi there. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna yell a little bit. If I'm too loud, let me know. I know some we got some challenge. Um, audios. And, you know, I, I just want to thank everybody for showing up today. Um, it's always, I always look forward to these little talks. And um, we've been talking for the month of March about present moment and some of the benefits of present moment and, and how you do it. And what I'd like to talk about today is I'd like to expand that just a little bit from the present moment into um, intention setting. I've been reading a book by Lynn McTaggart. I don't know if many of you know her. Uh, she wrote extensively about the field. Um, that's a great book. It's a heavy read, but it's a great book. Um, and she's also written something called Intention, The Art of Intention or something like that. So, um, and how do present moment and intention fit together? Well, I think, um, it's so simple, really, but, I, but I've been looking at some of the literature and some of the things that I've seen throughout the years, you know, as we went from spirituality being sold by a few of the major religions to now spirituality being packaged and sold to by everyone. I think in this commercialization of spirituality, I, I think we've lost a lot. And so I want to go back and talk about some people that I know Charlie's familiar with. Uh, some of the writings of uh, Trowbridge and Emmett Fox and some of the people who really had it, they had it, but their message was so simple um, that people missed it. And they they used to fill Madison Square Garden and various other lecture halls back in the 20s and 30s. And they talked about um, how an intention, any thought within emotion has to happen. Um, and, and the way that that, that goes is um, as above, so below. And our emotions are generated by our heart, by our mind. And even in the Bible, it says, ask and you shall receive. And so the, from those simple things, we've gotten so many manifestation programs and 
do this and do that. And I, I really tried to consolidate everything and bring it down to a very small uh, formula, if you will, for intention. And I think Lynn Taggart does that beautifully. So um, some of you, have many of you worked with intention and manifestation? Is that something that you work with regularly? I don't. You do, Sally, you, Sally, you do. What, how do you do it? Do you have a special way to do it? Well, it just depends on the on the context. So when I did a <laughs> sacramental journey yesterday, I've been fasting and then I spent a day writing my intentions, what I wanted to have happen. Then I had the journey. I'll have an integration session to see what what came up and then how can I integrate it in my life. In shadow work, when I facilitate shadow work, individual coaching or group, the people that choose to do work, the first thing we say is, what would you like to have happen here? So we're accessing their agency, we're accessing their ability to know what they want, which many people don't, and what their intention right. is. So I've also facilitated visualization workshops, and we always start with, what do you want? What's your intention? What would you like to take away from this? So it's a part of the way that I live, basically, personally and professionally. It's imp it's important to start <laughs> with our intention, right? Right. Um, and you bring up a great point. Um, it's important to know what you want. <clears throat> I think many of us don't know what we want because we keep changing our minds. And I, I heard a great analogy, and maybe you've heard this one, but it, it's like going to a restaurant and ordering steak and eggs. And so the waitress goes back and puts the order in and then she comes back to fill your coffee and you say, you know what? I don't want those steak and eggs. I'd rather have pancakes. So then the waitress goes and puts in the order for pancakes and cancels the steak and eggs. And then she comes back to fill your coffee and you're like, you know what? It's almost lunchtime. I'm gonna have a sandwich. And so we, we never really quite settle on what we want for sure. And if we keep changing the order, um, very much like the, the cook and the waitress, they can't help us because we never quite see something all the way through. And so I love that analogy. And it's something that is very, you know, it's very true in my life. Something I've really had to work at is what precisely do I want? You know, um, I've been doing some readings for people and some of what, some of the, the things that I can see this happening to them, it's like, I'm not sure what I want, but I really want to be happy. And so, you, you you know, you ask them, what does happy look like for you? You know, what, how will you know you're happy? How will you, what is happy look like? And many of them don't know. Uh, I'm happy when I have money. Is it really the money that you want? Or what is money going to get you? Well, money's going to bring me freedom. Okay. So it's not really that you want to be happy. And it's not really that you want money, but you want the freedom that money can bring you. So focus on freedom, you know, focus on exactly what it is. What's the nutshell? Where's the, what really is going to make your soul sing? What really is going to change things for you? Because many times, and I think some of us have experienced this, um, we really think we want something, we acquire it, however we do that. And then we realize it's not what we wanted at all. And I, I think that is what oper is operating. We've been so conditioned and trained to think that things will buy us, <clears throat> things will fill us up, things will make us happy. When in truth, there's always a greater soul purpose for a wanting or a desire. And that soul purpose a lot of time is, you know, like I said, freedom. Uh, I want to be able to communicate. I want, I have a message. I want people to listen. So it's, it's very important. And I like what Sally said about, you know, writing your intention down. Because if you write your intention down, you can look at it and say, I want, I want wealth. I want abundance. And then ask yourself the question, why do you want abundance? And then write that down. And then ask yourself, keep asking yourself why until you get to a point that just feels right. And that's where you can operate. That's where intentions start is with feeling. Um, if you listen to Emmett Fox or if you read any of his works, he talks about intention plus emotion. And, and what emotion do you need to have? 
is it intention plus anger? Is it intention plus anxiety? Is it intention? No, it's gratitude. It's intention plus gratitude as if the event has already occurred. That's all it takes to manifest. Intention and the de you have the desire, you create the intention, you find out what that really, what that intention is going to do, what where the intention is to make your heart sing, to make your soul light up. And then you um, act as though that thing, you've already received it. And that is with gratitude, because the proper way to receive things is with gratitude. So there's a lot to unpack there, um, even in that, those small sentences. Um, does anybody have any questions on that or any comments? Has anybody used that formula or seen it before? Well, a question I've always asked people is, what do you want? And they'll and they'll say, "Oh, I don't know what I want. I I can't make up my mind." And I just respond, "If you don't know what you want, how will you know when you found it?" Oh, you know, right. I, I know that's a simplistic way to look at things, but you know, in that in that case, you know, you. I was raised that it was your motives that determined your relationship with God. He knows what's in your heart. And so motive and intention for me have always walked hand in hand. Uh, one is the other. And, uh, you know, so you have to want something and you have to want it for the right motives and it all it all kind of steamrolls into a productive result. Right, because it sounds to me like, like you found the key to clarity, clarity for setting your intentions. And I think that is really what we're talking about here. So um, I like what you said, Kevin, about motive. So motive is very similar to Tell me about motive. What do you mean by that? It's not what you do, but why you do it. And mm -hmm. that is what, in my books, that is what the divine is going to use to determine our hearts. You know, and I can, I can donate a million dollars to charity, but if I'm doing it for the tax benefit, that's the wrong motive. If I'm doing it because I can honestly make a change in people's lives and make it better for them to enrich my heart as well. And instead of doing it as a, as a tax deduction and it only enriches my bank account, which doesn't give diddly squat. But, you know, uh, I... I it's your intention. It's your uh, your motive. What what drives you? Uh, my parents were strict fundamentalists, but that is what they imparted in me and instilled in me growing up. Was why are you doing it? Okay, so you set the intention, and then you clarify it with the why. And do you ask yourself those why questions? And I'm doing it because I want to feel good. Why do I want to feel good? How is it going to make me feel good? Those kind of questions. I'm hoping why comes before intention. Oh. You know, uh, I, uh, I hope I'm going into it with the right intention, with the right motives and whatever. And that doesn't come from a hour ago result that comes from a lifetime of service, uh, whatever that culminates and and becomes your your guiding heel. Uh, you know, that is what uh, should get you through life, whatever, you know. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know, maybe I'm lucky. It's just kind of come naturally for me. 
only because I learned the hard lessons when I was about 12, 13, 14. You know, that I was, I was thankfully channeled into the right mentality when it came to that, hopefully. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate that. And um, it sounds like you operate with a lot of integrity in your intention setting. And well, I think I that's tried. very important. Yes, I, it's very important. Yeah. Does anybody else have any any comments? I'm sorry, did I cut you off, Kevin? Yeah, can you hear me? No, no. You, I was pretty well. No, yeah. Okay. Can you hear Bobby? Yes, we can hear her. Oh, yeah, I, I was saying that I'm glad you brought up the idea of what we want. Because in my family, I can remember as a child, I must have said I want a lot. Because my mother's favorite saying to me was, it's not what you want that makes you fat, it's what you eat. And so she's pointing out that want, 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 uh, you know, that kind of thing that's, is her end to it. So I think it's, it's interesting to see in life, want means I'm missing something usually. So if you look at what conversely in the opposite side, it's 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 be you're lacking something that you that you desire to have. So okay, I think it's how you define want. That's a great point, Bobby, and I'd like to piggyback off what you're saying. And uh, Terry, I really appreciate the simplicity idea, and I love Emmett Fox, and Emmett Fox was the enlightenment that uh, saved our marriage. <laughs> but anyway, what Bobby was uh, saying is the same thing that Dr. Horror would have said, that a why question uh, is circular. It's like a dog chasing its tail. It does not come up with anything meaningful. Now, that being said, desire as interpreted by our famous leader, he said desire is D meaning of desire, meaning of God. So the purest desires that we have are our soul's intention. And so it, it's important for us to get in, in tune with our intentionality. Um, our alignment with our intentionality. Now, a better question to, let's say I, well, give an example with Emmett Fox. Um, uh, we were having a stressful time in our relationship. And, uh, and so I moved out of the house and uh, somebody uh, that I met at a, a Center for Spiritual Living suggested a book by Emmett Fox. And I brought that book back to my motel. And when I got to the part where it said something about you, <laughs> what you manifest is what you create. And I... I, I the light went on in my head. When I realized I had started a new business and I wanted to let Bobby know how hard I'm working, so I would bring home all the problems. Oh, I saw I had to do this, I had to do that, rather than all the wins that I had. 90% of the day, right? I was happy at what I was doing. Things moved smoothly. So I was only sharing Bobby with the negativity to try to prove how good I was or something. So when I saw that, I, I changed what I brought home. Now I called Bobby up on the phone and said, I'm coming home. And she said, uh -uh, I'm not so sure I want you here. <laughs> And so I did come home. I changed the tonality. I changed the uh, what I was sharing. And that meant a lot more. So what is the meaning of desire? 
I desire to have a, a loving, happy relationship. And so when you find out what that means for you, uh, that is, uh, the answer comes more apparent. Now, Thomas Hoare, when he was doing his healing work, somebody would come in and saying, you know, I've I got a pain in my back. And the therapeutic way he dealt with that, he would say, well, what does that pain mean to you? Now, see if you can get some answers from the pain. And, and then that somebody would come up with, well, uh, okay, what was my answer for that pain? I... Um, well, I, I fell down and I injured my back. Well, what's the meaning of you falling down and injuring your back? So eventually you get to a point of elucidation. That was the whole purpose of you to get the message from whatever it is to clarify what's important to you. And, and the end result is, he would say, and what is the meaning of what is? What is the meaning of what is? And what is, is the Spirit of God expressing its life in us as us. And when we return to that awareness, we're more like a spark plug. We're more like a glowing expression of the divine. Now, that's the task for me, is to know when I desire something, What's the meaning of that desire? And what does it I really want? What is it that God wants to happen through me? Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, anybody. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. I, I like what you said, what you manifest, you create. Because we are really, truly are manifesting all the time. We are manifesting our circumstances all the time. And it's the intention that helps us to manifest consciously. And um, when you ask the, the why question, to me, the why or the what, or, or why do I want this? Or what is this going to do for me? That helps us to generate the emotion, to find the emotion that we need to bring our intentions down to earth. Because, you know, if I want a car and I, I want this particular car, but I'm not really clear on why I want it. I can't, it's hard for me to generate the emotion I will need to get it. So in other words, if I want a, you know, a red Mazda, well, but you know, a yellow Volkswagen would do just as well. You know, I'm not going to get excited about the car, but I'm going to get excited about the ability not to have to walk or ride my bike. I'm going to get excited about now, you know, the world opening up to me because I can travel. And so that's the piece like you said, um, it helps us to create what God <clears throat> wants to happen for us because it touches our soul. And that's where we meet God in my mind. So we meet God in our soul. And if we can create that, generate that emotion and, and meet that place of God in our heart, that's to me where manifest happens. And that's quite frankly, I think what, what Amit Fox was saying in his simple way you know, um, people who are familiar with 12-step programs, there's a big thing about them. Uh, they say, fake it until you make it. And if you break that down, essentially, what they're saying is act as if. Act as if you are who you want to be. Act as if you are doing what you want to do. Act as if all these things are happening for you, and they will. And that is just a really, really, to me, simplified way of saying, fake it, um, of saying, um, intend with emotion in order to get what you want. So thanks, Charlie, and thanks, Bobby, both of you. Um, does anybody else have any um, experience or anything to say about intentions? Yeah, Terry, you brought up another thing that elicited. Uh, when I was in ministerial school and we learned to set our intention, it was called a five-step treatment. And uh, that was... Part of the big practice of being a minister was learning how to do these five steps that would align you um, with your intention, or better yet, with God's intention through you as you. 
And so when I was reviewed by a board of people who were saying, well, could you pray for somebody that wanted to manifest a house? And my answer for that was, yes, I could pray for somebody manifesting a house. But the uh, second step of the treatment process was the most important. And the first step of the treatment process was to identify with the source. Whatever words are important to you, however you connect to the source within you, is those words you use in this treatment. And the second step in the treatment then was to align yourself with the allness of God, the fullness of God. So when you got into your feeling nature that you felt one with the source, then you set your intention and then you would state it in a way that, like Terry said, that you already know you have it. So if I wanted to manifest a house, I might start by saying the treatment process is, I know God is all there is. I know that I'm one with God and that God is, has provided me or is providing me this perfect house right now. And I give thanks for that. And so it is. So for me, the important aspect of that was the alignment with our soul. And the way to do that was to acknowledge source, to unify with source, and then state your desire in a way that it's already accomplished. And that was a, is still a very effective way for me to live my life. Thanks, Charlie. I really like I really like that. And that sounds like wasn't it Emmett Fox that had the golden key? Do you remember yeah, the, the golden key? Golden key. That's that's exactly what that sounds like. It's the golden key process. All right. Very cool. Anybody else got anything to to say about what Charlie has talked about, or what we've been talking about, or maybe take it in a little bit different direction? Well. Uh, I agree with uh, everything Charlie says. I I, I kind of take it one step further. And I believe it was Kathleen McGowan that wrote, when, when we pray for something, uh, say we pray for uh, $1,000. Well, we're going to use that when we ask something to the universe, we tell the universe what they'll get back. I'm going to take that thousand dollars and donate it to a homeless charity or something. You know, uh, I like to take it one step further that if I if I get this, you will get that. I promise you that. You know, I, I tried to go at it from from that. Uh, just one step further. I don't know, you know. It, well, that that it sounds like for me. Yeah, that sounds like the more that you give, the more you receive. Exactly. And so that brings us to another topic, which is, you know, how how I think some of the people that I've spoken with, in me and myself, um, there's a worthiness issue. A lot of cases with with <laughs> receiving. You know, I'm worthy to receive ten thousand dollars. I, I hate to keep using money. How about let's see? Um, I guess we could use. Yeah, well, what do you love? <laughs> right. It's a or, it's a way to quantify. Um, or a house. Charlie was mentioning about if you pray for somebody's home, when you pray for them to have shelter and protection so that they can go on and do their ministry or whatever, you know that you benefit that family to take care of their four children or, or, or whatever, you know, take it one step further or right. I try to, I don't yeah, know. Right. Easy, so, so I think Emmett Fox would say, Charlie, wouldn't he say that, that abundance is like a river? You have to let it flow through you. You can't hold on to it. It must come through you to the universe and then it will come back around it's constantly in motion and so um like heaven said if you pray selfishly 
then it's not as effective as if you pray with uh, intent. Go ahead, Katrina. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't have anything to say. I didn't know my mic was on. I'm just listening. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, you're welcome to, if you have something to add, please, you're welcome to. I'd like yeah, to Terry. something, if I may. Sure. Okay. And I, <laughs> so, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, money has a bad rap, I think. And, you know, we live in a culture that uses money as an exchange for goods and services. So I just want to say I a uh, couple of things. My husband works for Chevron and we both came ba basically from from poverty. He knew it. I really didn't because I was in this big Italian tribe. But um, and we have very intentionally built financial wealth and abundance. And I am so grateful for all the ways we were guided to do that. So I just I just want to say when I can when we can for example this past week I took an 82 year old gorgeous she is the most amazing one of the most amazing women I've met. She's 82 years old and she has been the director of the Center for Healing of Racism. And I took her to a black uh, author bookstore. And um, it was just amazing. And when I took her home, I said, so we want to contribute to you. We'd like to donate. And she said, because we've done it before, she said, well, go through Chevron. My husband, as I said, works for Chevron. So Chevron matches it. So it doubles for her. It's a contribution for her. We do take get the tax benefit. So I'm grateful for that too, that I would you know, while I bless you and it blesses me, that's a great thing. So I just, I just want to say it, you know, money isn't an evil thing in my world. And I'm grateful. I have been without it. I have had it. I much prefer having it. But the more I have and the better I care for it, the more I'm able to give. So there is a win, win, win with that. And, um, you know, the other thing I'll say is I bought I built a real estate business. We bought real estate in Houston, getting ready to sell it in underserved neighborhoods, two black neighborhoods. And, you know, I'm spending money that I have made to divide that property. There's two properties on each lot so that I can make it affordable for people in that neighborhood. And I love that. You know, I'm a businesswoman. I want to be responsible for my money. So I get to win some individual who normally couldn't, you know, afford a home and build wealth gets to win and the neighborhood is contributed to. So um, I'm just grateful for all of that. And I just, you know, I don't think evil. I think the, what the what the Bible says is the love of money is evil. So um and my intention is to be generous, but to myself as well. That's yeah. I think a, a lot of people misconstrue uh, that Jesus of Nazareth had said that money is the root of all evil, and I believe his quote was, "The love of money is the root of all evil." So it's not, it's it depends upon um, you know how you hear it, and and you realize that he wasn't talking about loving. The thing itself, but just having needing to have it, being dependent upon it for your happiness, is not going to bring you joy. Well, and to take it one step further, dear, it means possessiveness. It isn't the word love is kind of a misnomer because God is love, but it's a possessiveness of anything that binds us. And what Terry was saying, it's being in the flow. Because you can't hold on to anything. Life is fluid. Life is energy in action. And so I've never tried to hold on to Bobby. I've never tried to hold on to my house. You know, I appreciate all these things. And you could even say I love them, but I'm not about to possess them. I think that's a key word. Yeah. So I like that, Charlie. And I think 
what we're talking about is not that money is a bad thing, but it's your intentions for the money. What are you going to do there with it? Go. Yeah. And so there's a clarification of that intention again. Are we going to, you know, how is it going to make us feel if we get it? But I want to, Sally, I'm interested in your journey from not having money. It sounds like you were had an abundant family life, um, but your journey from not having money to having money, did you find yourself at some point feeling unworthy or that you shouldn't have money? Or was it always your relationship with money very easy for you? I am a very uh, uh, committed 12-step seeker. So I found 12 steps when I was throwing up my food. <laughs> and I needed some help. Try as I might, I needed help. And then I found that, you know, I always thought I was too spiritual to care about money. And I really resisted you know, taking care of it, being a good steward of it, having clarity, you know, giving up vagueness. And I got involved in that. And it dawned on me one day, you know, the more money I have, the more I'm going to be able to contribute to other people. Because if I'm running around worried about how I'm going to feed my daughter, I don't really have a lot more to give. So for me, the context is 12-step uh, programs which really help people to, you know, for people who don't know how to be with money, it helps us to, you know, take responsibility, get clarity. I've read all the books, Catherine Ponder. I've been to lots of seminars. I had to really push through, you know, my, my grandparents all came from Italy. I grew up hearing stories of, you know, they grew up, all of my aunts and uncles grew up in the uh, uh, Great Depression. You know, my mother used to tell me her dad wouldn't eat until all the kids ate. Oh. So there was this, you know, we had enough and we were generous with what we had, but it was hard to move beyond that. And I have, you know, that's a, for me, it's been a spiritual solution. How can I be of service? You know, how, how please help my mind and my heart and my spirit to be aligned. So it's been a journey both on the outside, you know, how do you build wealth? And how do you do it with integrity and on the inside for me? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Because in reality, um, wealth, money is just another symbol of energy, right? It's just another symbol of, and how we manage our energy is how we manage our life. And that pretty much dictates how um, we manifest or how things come to us is how, in how we manage that energy. So, um, does anybody else have, have something they'd like to share on that? Thank you, Sally, for that. Laura. Oh, sorry. Um, getting back to the to the topic in the beginning of um, setting an intention and what do I want? Uh, as most of you know, I've been struggling from a back surgery and um, the progress is very much slower than I anticipated. And it's been very frustrating and um, I've had some meltdowns, but what I keep praying for is I just want my life back. Uh, and my goal is to go for a walk. Um, it's been eight weeks and I'm still on the walker and it's just, it's very disappointing, but I just keep trying to keep my eye on the prize of my goal that I just want to go for a walk. I just want my life back the way it was. Is that, am I saying the right thing? Am I wishing for the right thing? It, well, I don't know if there is a wrong thing, um, but I think the fact that you'd be able to go for a walk would mean what to you? It would mean health to you. It would mean freedom to you. It would mean being able to enjoy the outside. Those All things bring that. you joy. Right, that brings you All joy. All those things, yes. Mm -hmm. So maybe shifting the focus to those, the joy you would feel, the gratitude you would feel for your body and, and for your healing, if you were able to do those things, maybe just that little shift in consciousness. But again, it's entirely um, something that, that you do you, as they say, you do you. And I'm sorry you're going through that, but I know that you're a strong lady and you're going to come out the other end just fine. I know that. I just wish it was tomorrow. Well, sure you do. <laughs> sure you do. Does anybody else have anything for Laura? Help her. Well, well, the only thing I'm thinking 
after I got sick, it took me two years on a walker before I was able to walk again. So be patient. Thanks, Kevin. Not, not one of my virtues. <laughs> well, it's not one of mine either. <laughs> Let me tell you, I fought long and hard for that one. But and, it took and with, two years and I got off the walker and onto a cane. So, you know, there was a benefit at the end of it. And I got an incredible uh, staff given to me. So, you know... Uh, there were miracles all around. I just, you know, uh, was anxious to get back on my feet like the way I was the day before I got sick. Thanks, Kevin. Katrina, so, did you want to say something or did you just pop in again? Are you talking to me? Uh, do you have something, sure? Huh? No, I was just thinking, uh, sorry, my... Uh, Computer is, I am not a computer person. <laughs> so I I got on it this morning. But when we're talking here, uh, I've never had much in my life as far as financially, but there's all, but I've always had a good life. It just, in some ways, uh, I pay it forward and, and by doing something for someone, uh, not for money, but I think I'm always thinking about how, I don't know, just being with somebody and allowing them to express all of their stuff and not giving them uh I never have the money to give, but I have the time. So I give myself in ways that I can. So somebody will come to me and I'm not gonna charge them, but they're doing something for somebody else after. And so I find that that has been my, I have six children and they are just all, they're all okay. And that's my most fortunate thing that I have in my life right now. And each one of them are helping somebody else. And I think that that's how we all worked together. Like my oldest daughter and her husband, uh, she's now, she was a teacher, but then she took care of the girls and the kids that would be cutting themselves and taking care of all those kids. And now, after being on that job, and it's been five years, she's still out there helping a, a young man to go to court. She's helping another woman to do something. She just... She just she just shows up so i can't talk about money but that's that's what to that's money in a sense to me if that makes sense oh totally mm -hmm. i will say shirley i have been the benefit of your wisdom your ears and to me that has been priceless thank you yeah. well i think surely all of us have been benefited from your wisdom and your love. Oh, hey. And we listen, so appreciate it. I, I, the Madonna ministry has been such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful gift. All the money in the world could not have given me what I have gotten by being a member of the Madonna ministry. And surely it's a real testimonial to the, your lifestyle, your willingness to serve without asking for anything in return. You're a great model of that. And we've all observed your needs have been met. So it, you didn't have to look outside of yourself. You have enough faith 
And I also know over the years that some of your clients or people that you didn't charge money to would provide something for you, maybe a house or, a, I don't know, a car or something else that, that they would be gracious to, to return to you. So you are a testimonial to the faith in something greater than we are that we're one with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. But we're all that way. We all, you know, all the words that have been going through everybody and the sharing and everything, that's the greatest gift you could give anyone. And just sitting back here and listening to all of the things that you've spoken, it, 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 it fills my being and it connects me more. And I just, I just love you all. And I, I, I'm very fortunate and I thank you all. Thank you. That I have, yep. And yeah, Laura, there... I'd like to address what you were talking about walking. You know, there is some wonderful affirmations you can use, you know, to assist you in your recovery. But the important thing, it needs to be acknowledged that it's already happening. So you would say something like, I am happily walking. Something like that would be a great affirmation. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. You're welcome. Yeah, I think if you write a letter to yourself and talk in yeah. present tense as if you are walking and in that joy, that can be meaningful as well. Write it out. Thank you. I, Laura, um, I don't know you. <laughs> we, we determined that earlier. But um, what I wanted to say and experience when you were talking about how you just wanted your life back for me, there have been lots of different stages in mine. Um, the latest being motherhood and me saying, I'm just ready to have my life back. But the truth is that I'm not going to be the same person that I was prior to that experience, I'm going to be different. And for me, and I'm not saying this is your, you, but for me, I have to embrace that there's going to be a different Yvonne when I figure out who she is. <laughs> um, so it's just something to maybe consider. You know, I think that what and who Yvonne is going to be not because I won't be a mother but I'll be a mother of an adult which I am now um but that's just going to be different and hopefully it will be fuller and it will have different gifts <clears throat> and I think that those are all super super important um the other thing that I wanted to to get people's input, because this is one of the things that really, with intention um, and manifestation, there are times that I hold that tighter to my chest because I think that others and their intentions can offset. Yes. And so I would love to hear people's thoughts about that um there are times when i have set an intention that i needed it to be very, very specific and in order to do that i would not necessarily explore with others what that looked like so i guess what is your experience on that in sharing it in holding it tighter to your chest or knowing that other people's intention for you could be different and it can change things. So um, thoughts, any thoughts on that? I'd be happy to address it. It sounds like 
you brought up two good points. One is you can't hold on to the past, all right? Mm. And you can't hold on to the future. You can only express what is. And so I think what Terry is asking us to do is find out what that is, what the meaning of that is for ourselves. So what is important to you or anyone else, we have to ask ourselves, what is important for me? What's my mission here? What is my purpose? And yes, life is continually changing. And the way modality of serving will often change. But you, Vaughn, have brought up a very good point. You have to be in the spiritual energy of flow. And that means you don't hold on to the past. You can't hold on to the future. But you have to be here now. And as an example of Laura being here now, she, she'd like to return to the way that she used to walk. And her, she, there's something in her know that she can do better than what she's doing. So anyway, the answer might be then for her is to affirm what's important for her. Mobility, whatever that it, meaning of that, the freedom of that mobility is so important. We just put four walkers in our house so Bobby can be more mobile on different levels. And I'm grateful for that. And then we have a fifth walker in the car. Mobility is important, <laughs> as well as longevity, I guess. I don't know if that answers your question, Yvonne, but thank you for bringing up the subject. I like to believe that we come back better than we were before. Uh, I'm better for uh, spending uh, years bedridden. I'm a better. I'm a better person. Uh, I I look at life a little differently, and I think we should instead of oh we want to return back to the way things were. Maybe that wasn't quite so good. I want to come back better, and uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> that's my intention, you know. I like what both of you said because, you know, we long for yesterday without realizing that there's a way to get what we want. Maybe it doesn't look like it did yesterday, but it'll look, we need to be able to accept that it coming into the future. So in other words, you know, maybe uh, Laura a Walker, you'll get through the walker and you'll need a cane but you'll still be able to get around. It'll just look differently than it did before. And we've only got one minute left. And I, I just wanted to conclude with brilliant talk. Thank you so much, everyone, for the discussion, because I, I really think that together we're stronger. You know, we together our ideas, we make each other stronger. But to, to kind of circle back around to the present moment, one of the things, one of the keys, and I know Charlie, um, I know Charlie knows this from his setting the key, is that we can only create in the present moment. So if our intentions in our mind is on the past and how things were in the past and recapturing the past, we are not in the present. And if we are thinking about how it's going to come in the future and we set our mind on a certain expectation, we may miss the beauty and the gifts that we've been given today. And so it's very important to find the present moment, even for just a few seconds per day, find the present moment with gratitude because that is where our manifestation comes from and that is how we create. Wow, but <laughs> Nikki's got a new bodysuit. You wanna talk about that? <laughs> yeah, I just <laughs> discovered this yesterday. <laughs> I have a friend who's been a paraplegic for I don't know, three, four years now and uh, he just discovered this bodysuit, and so he's getting one as a as a therapeutic, as a rehabilitation. 
and what he's been able right. to do, not through this suit necessarily, but through his work and his focus on getting better. He went from quadriplegic to paraplegic, and now he's got this suit. So he's anticipating he's going to have even more mobility as life goes on. Wonderful. Yeah, he's got a great attitude about it. Yeah, but that's a great example of not determining the outcome, allowing yeah. the universe to create the outcome for you. Yeah. And and believing and knowing and being grateful for the outcome. Be knowing and believing and being grateful that it's going to benefit you and everyone you come in contact with. And I think that's what we've all been talking about today. Serving, using our abundance, using our energy, using our efforts, using whatever it is God has graced us with to help other people. Because it, truly, that, that's what we're here for, is to have discussions, to lift each other up, to, to enrich each other's souls. Um, and this has been an amazing experience of that. Um, thank you for all that. And thank you for um, allowing me to speak. And thank you. It's been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just just say one thing? I wouldn't be where I am today had I not met all of you and became a part of the Madonna ministry because it's helped me so much in, in the gifts that I have been given physically, emotionally, mentally, it's helped me a lot. And I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for that. Thank you, Sherry. What were you gonna say, yeah. Laura? I just wanted to say real quick that this experience has um, really given me so much more empathy towards the people that I work with in hospice. Um, spending time in a rehab. I've never been in a rehab before. And boy, do I have so much more empathy for my clients that I see that are in rehabs. So it, it was a gift. It was not fun, but, but I am looking at it as a gift. Good. Beautiful. You're already better. <laughs> so what's happening next week? Next week is Easter, and we're going to be hearing from Sally B. She's got some All nice right. words on the pagan side of the Easter story. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful week. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love you all. Thank Have you. a blessed week. Thank Bye. you. Thank Many you, Terry.